Good morning. So if you're not familiar with me, my name is Sean, uh, and I do represent Walk for Water. So normally when you see me, you think it's Walk for Water season, but this is a very special congregation to me. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more why this congregation is special when we get into our lesson. But today is Walk for Water Sunday, and I apologize my voice is a little hoarse. I just got it back. I've got a cocktail of Tennessee allergies, and now I've got Ohio mixed in there, and I'm really struggling uh, with allergies. Um, but it's good to be up in the north and to feel the warmth of Tennessee. Uh, 90 degrees yesterday, felt like I was still in Nashville, so thank you for that experience. Twofold this morning, we're going to look at Walk for Water uh, a little bit, and then we're going to go into a lesson. But uh, for you that don't know what Healing Hands International is, real quick, this is our mission, and this is the ways we accomplish this. Our mission is to aid, equip, and empower those in need around the world in the name of Jesus Christ so that they may experience God's healing grace. And we do that through several programs. Clean Water, which is what you're doing today, our Hunger to Harvest, which is our agricultural program, Women of Hope, which is something that has been going on here for years. I uh, remember back when Jerry was here, she'd call me up and say, hey, the ladies need more stuff, drive it up. So I became a pack mule for Women of Hope product. The Magi Project, I know you've all participated in that, and then Disaster Relief. This congregation has given in times of need around the world. Most recently, you guys gave to the Ukraine efforts. And I could go on about that all morning of these different programs, and I don't want to do them injustice, but I do say thank you on behalf of Healing Hands. More importantly, thank you on behalf of those around the world that are receiving the blessings. Uh, and what's amazing through that is if Healing Hands doesn't get any of the recognition around the world, but God's glory is given to those in need, then that's what it's all about. And so this morning we're going to look at what you're doing today, clean water. These pictures never get old to me. I've had the experience to travel overseas to see people get water for the first time, to see them get water for the second time after their well may break. But it doesn't matter whether you're young or old, clean water makes a difference. It's something in this audience we do not relate to. We don't struggle with clean water. We may think we do, but honestly we don't. We don't even think about how much water we use. Uh, how many of you this morning took a shower? You don't have to raise your hand because that might put judgment on you if you don't. How many of you used the washing machine in the last couple of days, the dishwasher? We just use water in abundance and we don't think about it. And the water that's going through that most of the time is clean. And this is where Healing Hands has been able to do work through partnerships with Lancaster and other churches to bring clean water around the world. One day I'd love for that whole map to be covered. The crisis will probably all there be in my lifetime and lifetimes to come. But every drop of water we can give to someone is making a difference. But I want to tell you a real cool story to get your mind set for this morning, kind of set the theme for our lesson today. I want you to meet the lady on the right. Her name is, or excuse me, on your right, my left, Barina. Barina is about, I think is 78, maybe 80 years old. Our staff just met her in the last year. A well was put in her community. But let me tell you what Barina said uh, after I kind of set the background. So her village, by the way, she lost her husband. She lost both of her kids and she's raising her grandchildren. Uh, and what she has to do for her family every single day is get water. But in her community, they don't have water nearby, so they have to go to another community, another village. And she walks several miles there. But see, that village represents the one well for a whole bigger region. And so her village only can come twice a week. So the night before her day to get water, she travels out and spends the night. She doesn't go to a hotel. She doesn't go to somebody's house. She camps on the ground. When our staff were over there, our vice president and president were over there, they visited the, of the well where they were going, and there was just fire pits that were, that were there. And they asked, why are there fire pits? And they said, well, when people come to get water, they want to keep warm at night, and they want to keep the hyenas away. So when the well came into Barina's community, she said, I now can sleep in my own bed. Now let's let that sink in for a second. Did anybody this morning get up and walk for water? Did anyone sleep outside because they needed to get water for their family? It's a perspective we can't understand. I've been there. I've been in countries where they don't have water. And guess what? Where I stay has water. I don't even understand it. But I will say for her, but look what changed because of efforts like you all and others. Her community has a well now. What I love about this picture, because it's not a video, but this is a picture, 
is that is people dancing. Now, the last time I checked, and I didn't see anybody in the bathroom or in the, in the water fountain in the hall, I didn't see anybody dancing because they had clean water. Uh, actually, I didn't even see smiles. I just saw a normal, oh, got to go wash my hands and go on. But for people, when water is dirty, when water is not accessible, and now all of a sudden they're given something, it truly changes everything. And I'm going to get that in a second. All right, so let's take a walk down memory lane. Do you all realize that last year you celebrated your 10th annual Walk for Water? So if you do your math, this year is the 11th annual Walk for Water. Good, good job. But this is, going back, I found group pictures all the way back, not all of them, but here are some. So this was last year. What you're going to love about this when we go back, instead of kids getting bigger, they're going to get smaller. Uh, people without hair in this picture may have hair as we go back. Uh, people without wrinkles, uh, you, do, you get the whole picture here. This was my, one of my favorite examples of how you don't know what you get in Ohio. This was 2021, and I literally froze that day. Uh, Michael came to his, one of his first ever walk for wires. Poor guy's bundled up, uh, but you can see us all there freezing and still walking. 2020, uh, here in the parking lot we walked, we practiced safe distancing, even in our group photo. Uh, 2019, 2018, I told you people are getting smaller and smaller, aren't they? You might not even recognize yourself as you get many years past. But as you can see, that goes back, that's 2016 right there. Uh, and that is, so let me tell you though, in 2014, your second ever walk, I was privileged to come up here. And at that walk, I'm, I'm a new, I'm not new to healing hands, I'm new to walk for water. And I'm here and I'm like, I'm gonna get this church to do Magi. I'm all gung-ho about my new role at healing hands. I'm walking along and I meet this gentleman and I say, hey, blah, blah, I give him the whole spiel. He said, well, you need to talk to my daughter. I said, okay. She's been to Zambia. I mentioned Zambia is where we send Magi boxes. So here I am. Perfect. This, this lady's going to talk to me about Zambia. I'm going to get her on Magi. Life's going to be a joy. I'm walking with her. She proceeds to start talking to me. In a second, you're going to understand who this is. She's a nurse, and she says, she starts talking to me about this patient of hers and this problem they're going through. And I'm like, I don't care about your patient. I don't care about your problem. I want you to do Magi. Long story short is uh, I get back and I'm leaving Lancaster. I'm in the Columbus airport and I'm flying and my coworkers going different, whether they're going to Texas, I'm going to Nashville. And they say, what did you think about Kristen? I said, nice. Two weeks later, Kristen came through Nashville. We had our first date. And now I'm proud to say that Kristen Hall, now Kristen Judge, is a proud Proud to be, um, I'm proud to have her as my wife, and she is the proud mother of my two children, Riley and Michael, which Riley you'll hear crying. Thankfully for you all, Michael is confined in the kids' worship. <laughs> but real quick before we move on, in 10 years, you guys have raised $40,584 for clean water. That's pretty impressive when you stop and think about it. And today you have an opportunity to be part of it again. Just an update, Alex told me to tell you that when you get to the park, drive to the parking lot that's on the top. Uh, it's now called the Orchard Hill Entry. But anyways, that's where our shelter's gonna be, that's where we're gonna go. If that doesn't make sense, then get lost like I will be and we'll find you. So let me ask you something. We're gonna talk about this and you're gonna get shirts today if you come out the walk to have this on the front. Clean water changes everything. And we saw what that did for Barina. We saw what that does in past, what you all have done to bring clean water to people. And you said, okay, it does make a difference. But let me ask you this. In your time frame on this time on earth, what has changed your everything? I want you to just think in your mind. I'm going to share some examples. You can nod your head. Maybe this will, you're gonna, some of you are going to be like, I knew what life was before some of this stuff. But would you say that the GPS has changed your life? Maybe before GPS, in my, I was thinking back, when I was a youth minister, it was MapQuest. And you want to go farther back, maybe you're like, no, a compass changed my life. What about, um, now all of us, I don't think any of us will claim to be back there when the light bulb was invented. But would you say light bulbs, electricity have changed everything for you? Um, what about 
telephones. Now, let's go back to one where you had to do the, the rotary phone. Then we got lucky and we had the push the button phone. And now kids are like, what do you mean? We have cell phones. But when you say the phone has changed everything, uh, cars. Soon our cars are going to drive ourselves around. I think some are trying right now to drive us around without us touching the wheel. Um, but cars, airplanes, and then this is the biggest one. There's not a young person in here, probably not an adult that's not going to say it, but would you say the internet has changed our everything? Imagine a world without internet. I really think if you want to stop America, you don't have to kill a bunch of people. Take out the internet. We'll start fighting. We won't know what to do. How do I cook food? Well, I can't go to Google to look it up. How do I find food? I don't know. The grocery store doesn't work. I can't use my card. You think about how much internet has changed our lives. Now, I want to focus you down a little bit further, though, as we work on this, talking about what has changed our everything. Look at your individual lives. And I want you to think in your mind, what has changed my everything? Has anybody ever moved? Not just moved down the street or in the same town, but have you moved states, cities, changed schools, lost your friends, started a new job? Would you say that's changed your everything? What about your education? What about your job? Friends. Relationships. Spouse. This one I can guarantee does change you. Children. Experiences. Tragedies. We can look at those things and we can start looking at ourselves and saying, you know what? Yeah, that did change my everything. But I want to drive it down a little bit farther and get into our lesson today. You see, we talk about today clean water changes everything for walk for water. But this is the question I want to ask you. Has Jesus changed your everything? I got this quote from a preacher. His name is Dave. It was on the internet, surprisingly enough. He actually a preacher down in a church in Fort Myers. He had a little cheesy story before this, but I, I used to share it, and I was like, no, this one. But listen to this quote that he came after he shared this little story. Sometimes things or people change right before our eyes. We may or may not understand or how, understand how or why the change occurred. Sometimes what we experience to come or understand changes everything. Sometimes one thing changes everything. The Bible says a lot about change. God specializes in changing people. In fact, the gospel message is presented to the world by Jesus and the apostles as the ultimate change agent. So I want to ask you this question again. Has Jesus changed your everything? I stand before you as a person that can honestly say sometimes I let everything distract me from letting Jesus change me. But I'm thankful that he's always waiting on me. And that he will change my everything. But let me ask you this question also. It might step on some toes, but think about this. Can you say Jesus has changed my everything, but yet it not show in your life? See, if you say that, then Jesus truly is not in your heart because Jesus is the ultimate change agent. Jesus is the one who changes, but if you're not letting him into your life, then you're not going to show. And so you can't really say that statement. So in a second, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as our passage this morning, but I want you to think about this. Did Jesus change your life when you first encountered him? Maybe your first encounter is this morning. Maybe you've been going to church for years and you didn't encounter him until sometime down the road. Maybe it was that moment when you were with someone and it came into clearance and you're like, wow. And you're getting to know him? Are you getting to know him? You ask, well, how do you get to know him? Well, there's a lot of ways. One way is to be in his word. One way is to be in prayer. One way is to be together as a church. Are you living with him? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's turn over in your Bibles there, 17 through 20. I want you to listen to this as we're reading the hall. I'm going to pull out two verses to, to highlight. But think about this. Before Jesus, after Jesus in our lives. Starting at 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, 
in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Very first passage I read, if anyone is in Christ, the old has passed and the new has come. So think about that. When Jesus comes into your life, did you put the old away? Did you become changed? Or did you say, I want the benefits of what I hear, but I'm not ready to make the change. I want the gift of eternity, but I don't want to sacrifice my own personal stuff in the meantime. That's hard, isn't it? It's not easy to truly give of ourselves. Would you not say that as we as individuals are selfish? Sean Judge is selfish. I want things my way. I'm not up here saying I'm different than anybody else. I do things my way. And sometimes I let that get in the way of letting Christ work through me. And so me, myself, blocks that change. But when we truly focus our lives around Christ, when we truly walk with him, when we live with him, when we get to know him, he changes us. The other passage, verse 20 of that same little passage we're looking at. So Jesus has changed us. The old is gone, the new has come, and what's the result of that? Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. I was actually reading some commentaries on this. I think it can apply to us. I think we can be ambassadors for Christ. Paul, I think, was referencing from what I read, and I'm no scholar myself, that he was talking about him and the apostles. But when you think about an ambassador, and it's interesting, a guy that works for an international organization, what is an ambassador? If you go to another country, you have a United States ambassador that represents our country. Are we representing Christ when he comes into our life? For the children that are not in here, the younger children, what does it say about when we become Christians, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine? Adults. If we're called to be ambassadors, are we going out and representing Christ? When people see us, first of all, do they see something different in us? And secondly all, are we truly being ambassadors for him? Because if we say Jesus has changed my everything, but yet no one can tell, has he really done that to us? And it's not because Jesus can't change you. Don't mistake that. Jesus can change anyone. It's because we oftentimes do not let Jesus into our lives. And so we should wear a shirt instead of saying clean water changes everything. We should wear a shirt every day that says Jesus changes everything. And so when someone asks you what that means, you tell them your testimony of how Jesus has changed your everything. I read another quote when I was looking up some stuff about this passage. And I thought this was really interesting. It said, we should take this calling and treat it with respect and behave appropriately as representatives of Christ. We, out of love, reverence, and fear of the Lord, ought to not only live in a way that reflects our faith, but convince other people to do the same. So I go back and I ask this question to you. Has Jesus changed your everything? Is it evident? I'm going to give you four thoughts that I want you to ponder as you go on your day-to-day, -day, as you go throughout your week. First is, does Jesus transform your minds? That's tough. Why? Because of things like I said. The internet, the TVs, the music floods our minds with everything, right? But is Jesus changing your mindset? Does Jesus transform your desires? Before Christ, I had a desire to do this. After Christ, has that changed? Is Jesus transforming your relationships? Before Christ, I was like this to people. After Christ, I was like this. These are questions, these are things you have to ask yourself in your, your own minds. And does Jesus transform your purpose? This quote, this quote to me is really one that I think describes what most people would agree with when you hear it. This guy's name is Sidney J. Harris. He worked for the Chicago Daily News a long time ago. Our dilemma is that we hate change and love it at the same time. What we really want is for things to remain the same but get better. Are we guilty of that? How many of you say, I want change, or I want you to change, for me to have a better life, but don't ask me to change? Is anybody guilty of that? 
we want change, don't we? We're always saying, I wish, I mean, we could get on so many topics today about change and get all on our pedestals, couldn't we? About how others need to change. And it'll make this place a better place. But then when it says, oh, I need to change? No. But is that how it is with our life with Christ? We want the blessings, but when we read the passage, it tells us to do things differently, to be transformed. Romans 12, chapter, or Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Yeah, I don't think I want to do that. I'll do that on Sundays. It's okay, I'm sitting in the pew right now. I'm transforming my mind. But when I walk back out that door, I got my own comforts. Oh, Jesus, you want me to do something extra during the week for church? Ah, I'm too busy. I'm not trying to call anybody out because I'm talking to myself, but we have to be people, followers of Christ, that our lives are changed completely so that Christ shines through us. So as we wrap up this morning, I'm just going to share a couple of passages. You don't have to turn there. But I think we've got to set our minds to let that happen. We have to let Christ work in us. If we're not ready for it, he's not going to be able to change us. Isaiah 64, verse 8 says, But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. Are we ready for God to mold us? I have no clue what it means to be a potter. I've seen it on TV, you know, the masterpiece. If I was to sit down and try to work with clay... It would be one big blob. It would be worse when it, it would look better when it went on the thing before it came off. But when God works in our lives, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, We are God's, some versions say handiwork, some say masterpiece. God wants to turn us into something so much greater than we can ever imagine. He wants to unleash our potential, He wants to mold us into using us so that we can go out and do good things for him. Are we, are we willing to be the clay? Are we willing to be molded by our Father? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, talks a lot about the same thing we've been talking about. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that your battle cry when you go out? Every single day is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. There was a wrestler for Penn State University. I know that's probably not good to talk about Penn State here, but it's not Michigan, right? And most of you are probably like, there's wrestling. There is collegiate wrestling. Back during March Madness for basketball, there was also a wrestling tournament for the NCAA. This guy named Aaron Brooks Good wrestler. If you're into wrestling, not Hulk Hogan style, talking about like the, the wrestling. I don't want to say real because somebody might in here might be actually like a Hulk Hogan maniac and throw body slam me or something. And probably don't know who Hulk Hogan is. I'm really dating myself. I don't even know who the new wrestlers are, so I apologize. But look at this. I was watching TV one day, or no, excuse me, I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw this thing and I clicked on, on a little link. Aaron Brooks is a wrestler, and the interview guy comes up, the ESPN guy comes up and says, why are you so good at wrestling? And he keeps on asking these questions. The whole time Aaron Brooks speaks, he is saying constantly, it's not I, it's the spirit within me. It's not I, it's what God's given talent, and I'm able to use it. I am just a platform. And I went back and I typed in some other interviews with him just to see if that was a consistent message. Every time I could find him speaking in some answer, he always gave credit to God. And this is one of the things he said. This platform, talking about wrestling, is great to wrestle on, but it's to glorify God. This, come, this stuff comes and goes. I'm blessed with this opportunity, these gifts. They're not mine. He gives them to me to bring glory to him. Has Christ changed you enough that when you talk to someone and you accomplish something and you share something, is Christ who you're telling is the reason that, that it's happened. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we went through verse 20. If you were still there, look at verse 21. We're going to close it out as our invitation this morning. You see, for some of us, we're not understanding that Jesus can change everything because we don't understand what it means to have Christ in our life. I will tell you this. I know there are wonderful people in this congregation that will sit down and talk with you. They will share what Christ means to them. 
They will show you through his word what it means to have a relationship with them. Because they want you to, to have that change. I also know that there are people in this congregation that will wrap your arms, their arms around you, whether physically or if you're uncomfortable. I don't even know what the word is. Hypothetically, and walk with you with whatever struggles because they know that only by showing you the love of Christ can change come in your life. Because they believe that. And for some of us that have said, you know what, I have been with Christ. I've been baptized. I've lived with them. But I'm in a state of mind where I'm blocking them out. The good thing is that Christ doesn't say, oh, you turned your back on me. I'm done. He's waiting there. The prodigal son story, we've read it many times from younger ages to older ages. God's waiting, saying, come back. It's okay to say that you're in a rut. We're not perfect. Two passages I remember very on in my life. I don't remember a lot, but Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. Guess what? We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So that means we're all equal in the fact that none of us are perfect. And the second thing is, if we realize that sin, what he says, that sin, the wages of sin is death. So if we've all sinned in the wages of sin or death, then we're all in the same boat. Whether we've been Christians for 40 years or whether we're just new to Christ, whether we learn about him, guess what? Christ's blood covers all our sins. And we're going to mess up. I promise you this. I'm probably going to mess up today. His blood covers my sins, and I can be praising God for that. But listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Can I put it up there? For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Wherever you are in the audience today, if there is something that is weighing on your minds, if there's something that's urging you to learn more, maybe today is the day you said, you know what? I'm ready to take on Christ in baptism, to be buried and raised anew, to put away the old and let the new come, to walk out these doors and say, you know what? I'm ready for Jesus to change my everything. You have an opportunity in a second. If you want to come in the invitation to be baptized, if you're wanting to come down and say, you know what, I just need the prayers of my brothers and sisters. I just need some help. There's a lot of people here that I know would love and support you. We'll pray with you. But whatever your need is, I encourage you as together we come and sing.